Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Daily Objective. And today is everybody's favorite day of the week, Philosophy Friday. Uh, we're going to be continuing the discussion about Immanuel Kant's philosophy. Uh, and we've got the returning, I almost were tempted to say expert, but he is a, he's a philosopher. He is quite learned on Kant and on many other things. And please welcome him. Give it up for Jason Rines. Hi. Thanks for having me, Rucka. Of course. So we did two episodes about Kant's metaphysics and epistemology, and I don't want to risk uh, spending too much of our valuable time reviewing all that. So I'll, I'll try to summarize it, and we'll try to summarize it quickly. Um, to Kant, the world of appearances is the phenomenal world. It's kind of like you're in a nightclub called Club Phenomenal, and as long as things are functioning... As long as the club is running and, and everything is in place, you know, like the rules are being enforced properly. Those are kind of like the structures that are there. Um, so as long as we're kind of perceiving and experiencing the world, we know there's certain rules in place, certain structures that um, we don't entirely understand where uh, we don't, we don't know the noumenal world. That's the world outside of this uh, nightclub metaphor. So metaphorical nightclub. We, we, so we don't really know the true world, but we know the world of appearances. And as long as we're, as long as things are appearing to us, we know that like the, the system is running properly. Yeah. There are what he calls regulative principles. They're the kind of operating rules of our own consciousness. So we are familiar with a world created through the structures of our own consciousness. Um, and that has certain rules, the rules like everything is gonna be formatted in space and time, and it's going to follow causal sequences and the rules of these other a priori concepts called the categories. And, and then what's true about things in themselves, we don't know. Um, he doesn't ever seem to doubt that there is things in themselves, but we don't know anything about what they're like. They're, they're not spatial and temporal. He probably ought to have said we could never know that, but he, his view is like, no, space and time is just our, our formatting. Um, and this, this comes up a little bit in when we get to his moral theory today in, in two ways. One is that... Um, we're going to see that like, like say mathematical knowledge, like anything that counts as capital K knowledge, Kant thinks that morality is going to have to be something called a priori, meaning prior to experience. It can't just be something in, I got from induction based on a couple past experiences that would have no necessity to it. That would have no guarantees to it. But morality, he thinks is something it's got to have rules. So it's going to somehow have to be something not sort of gathered up from within experience, but something put down. Now, moral laws don't structure experience the way that, say, cause and effect does. Um, they, they, if they did, we would have to be moral. They would, it would just force us to, but it's not like that. They are laws of, of, of freedom. So they're different in that respect. The other way it comes up is that, um, in order, morality, Kant thinks, does require that we be free. And he thinks that sort of everything here with under the stamp, under the rules of cause and effect, is deterministic. So that means that some part of us that is free has to be noumenal. It has to be the sort of transcendent part of us. And that gets, that raises a number of questions. It raises some interaction questions, like how am how is the phenomenal me, the me of experience, related to the noumenal I, the noumenal self? It's one thing. Another is um, what kind of freedom it could be and how it could work and all, all kinds of things like that. Um, and, and finally, there's a sort of question about where Kant thinks knowledge of morality comes from or how we have access to it. Um, one of the idealists, the many German idealists who followed in Kant's wake, one of the more famous ones, Schopenhauer, um, I think actually he thinks of himself as a, as a Kantian. I think he's sort of, he's right. He simplifies some things in Kant's system, but he thinks that Kant kind of helped himself in a sort of mystical way to the noumenal when it came to morality. 
And I tend to think Schopenhauer is right in this respect. So we can get to that eventually. That is that I, I tend to think that when it comes to morality, Kant does sort of start to sound a little less critical idealist, a little more almost platonic, a little more mystic in the sense of like, well, we just know this is somehow from the numerals, but we'll get to that. Okay. Now I have uh, notes here that I took when I was, when I consumed your uh, Kant lectures from those years back. Um, and I've got the notes saying Kant does, is an incompatibilist when it comes to free will. So to him, freedom is an illusion. So I, I guess that would mean maybe in this noumenal dimension, you, you're making choices, but here in this world of appearances, it, you're not really, you don't really know if this choice is, is, um, is you making the choice or not, but you better act as though it's you making the choice. So you, lest you try to defer responsibility to your noumenal self. Well, being an incompatibilist doesn't mean you think freedom is an illusion. Being an incompatibilist just means that you think that being free and being and determinism being true are incompatible. I'm an incompatibilist. I think if determinism is true, we are not free. Mm -hmm. um, now, Kant thinks that in a way, or in certain respects, determinism is true. That is, he thinks cause and effect is deterministic, and he thinks the the, the category of cause and effect ex structures our experience. But at the same time, Kant thinks that we are under moral obligation. Kant thinks ought implies can. You can't tell me what I ought to do if, if I have no choice in the matter. He thinks he is an incompatibilist to his credit. He thinks morality requires freedom and freedom requires we be metaphysically free. But there's a sense in which the phenomenal self is not metaphysically free. And so the noumenal self has to be where that freedom resides. And so that puts him in this position of effectively saying, yeah, the empirical you is not free, but the noumenal you could be. And if the noumenal you um, is sort of chooses morality or something, um, then this you is guided by morality. And initially, the, er the earliest way Kant puts it is that if you make the moral law, if the moral law becomes your kind of law of operation, then you are free. And you are autonomous, meaning self-ruled. Because morality comes from reason, it comes from your true self. And so your true self is setting your own law. Noumenal you is saying, follow morality. You are following morality. You are self-legislated, right? On the other hand, if morality, if noumenal you is saying, follow morality, and then you're saying, no, I'm going to go with my appetites, my body, my drives, my inclinations, then it is heteronymous. It is ruled by another. And then you're not free. And so his earliest kind of his way of putting this like in the groundwork of the metaphysics of morals in the mid 1780s sort of makes it sound like when you're under, when you're guided by the moral law, you're free. When you're not guided by the moral law, you're unfree. But that doesn't make any sense because how can it be that you're free when you're moral and you're unfree when you're immoral? Then, then you're not freely immoral at all. So that, that doesn't make sense. And he tries to switch it around a little bit where he ends up, where he ends up in, um, in religion within the bounds of reason alone in the 1790s, is he says that there is a fundamental maxim. There's like a fundamental rule that is sort of selected at this noumenal level. And either the kind, your true self either selects to follow morality or it selects not to follow morality. And then that sort of sets the agenda for empirical you and how it plays out or something like that. And he tends to think that all of us have chosen wrong, um, <laughs> which, which is problematic in its own respect, but he just thinks that's an a posteriori claim. Kant says, just look around. It looks like all of us are fallen beings who, have, who do not take morality seriously enough and we lie to ourselves about it. Um, but it's probably, it, we could get into like the kind of the, the trickiness of Kant's views about free will and morality. And, and it's something of a, of a 
Sarlacc pit will just get devoured in it. Um, mm-hmm. But um, it might be easier to leave. Well, we can, I mean, if you want to go into it, we can go into it. I, I think it maybe makes more sense to just talk about what he thinks morality is and how it works um, and leave aside the kind of metaphysics of it because that's sure. kind of a mess. Yeah, yeah, I, I yeah, of course. Um, now we've sort of uh, touched upon the whole free will uh, aspect of obviously that you have to consider when t- think about choices. Something I, I want to um, sort of highlight as well is that uh, Kant, in my understanding, sees the pursuit of your appetites or your interests, generally being motivated by your own values, is reprehensible and dangerous. It's um, something I see a lot in philosophy, the maybe the utilitarians, various, philo- maybe going back to the Greeks, um, various philosophers are basically saying, if you're going to be selfish, it's going to be unsatisfying. It, to me, it kind of taps into adolescent frustration. And they kind of offer, well, there's something higher than your own selfishness that you can follow. Do, have you seen what I'm seeing? Can you sort of uh, yeah. you speak to that? So, so it's certainly the case. It's certainly the case that Kant does not think that morality is about following your own inclinations. Kant certainly thinks that sort of committing to following your inclinations, whatever they are, including putting them above the moral law, is wrong. And he calls that like the principle of self-love, which he means in a bad way, like that selfishness. It's not the case that Kant thinks that the pursuit of your own inclinations as such is is bad, Um, that anytime you go after something that you're inclined to do, it's bad. What he thinks is bad is thinking that's more important than morality or thinking that morality has to line up with that. So the way Kant sees it is we have these various moral duties. Um, They are binding upon us. They, they have authority to tell us what to do. We should listen to it. That, that, is, that is what reason is telling us to do. Most people, when they don't do it, um, are just are, are acting out of their, their inclinations, their desires. And even most people, when they follow the letter of the moral law, are usually doing it because it happens to line up with their inclinations anyway. But if there were a conflict between their duties and their inclinations, they would not follow their duties. And he thinks that's a problem too. There are cases where your duty, what morality says is your job to do, and your inclinations, they might coincide, right? So you want to be, you want to help your friend, and morality would also like you to do that. Um, the mere fact that you want to do it does not mean you don't care about your duty. It does mean that we can't maybe tell which is decisive. Are you doing it because you want to do it? Are you doing it because your duty? But the fact that you want to do it doesn't mean you don't care about your duty. So there, there was a way that for most. Most of most of the history of Kant studies, Kant was sort of misunderstood. As soon as he wrote this, he was misunderstood um, as sort of saying, "If you want to do it, you can't do it out of your duty." That that's scholars now and and when Rand was writing, that was what most people understood Kant's view was. So she is not unusual in thinking it. But there, Kant scholarship on this point has improved. Now now what we think is that. He didn't think that wanting to do it meant you couldn't do it from your duty. He just thought like you were suspect, like probably you're only doing it because you want to do it. It's probably easier if we just talk about these duties and and inclination. I I will say this. There are are theories that we have sort of a self-interest and that we kind of fulfill it, we flourish, and it might look something more rational. There are theories that we just have desires and we want to satisfy them. Kant's view about what happiness is, is the la- is more of a satisfactional view. And in that way, it looks like some utilitarian views where it's just like we have certain desires and inclinations, and we just want to satisfy them. And happiness is just satisfying enough of them, getting enough of the things we want. Now, 
most like ancient Greek philosophers would say, happiness is not just anything you want, not if you want the wrong things. And getting the things you want, if you want the wrong things, will not make you happy. And that would also be Rand's view as well, that happiness is not an amalgamation of satisfied desires. Um, and, but that that's how Kant sees it. And, you know, not for nothing, but it makes sense if he thinks that that's highly subjective. Yeah, just whatever the hell you want, put that way, that would be subjective and satisfying it would, would not have you know, necessarily moral significance. So to Kant, the only way you know your action is moral is if it's antithetic, if it's opposite of what you want. Is that right? The only way you know for sure. Mm -hmm. So it's not, you can have duties that line up with your desires and you might do them out of duty. You wouldn't know for sure what was motivating. So Kant, so Kant gives this example, right? If you have a man who is happy and he fulfills his moral obligation not to kill himself. We have a duty not to commit suicide. Well, there's, there's, he's probably not doing it because he has a duty not to commit suicide. He's doing it because he's not killing himself because he likes his life. But if you had someone for whom life was a burden and they were miserable, but they knew it was wrong to commit suicide, we would know they were, they were preserving their own life out of a sense of moral obligation. We would, because they have no personal interest in keeping themselves alive. They hate life, right? Now, now Kant thinks there are plenty of cases where there are people who are like, who they respect the moral law. They're like, look, I, I won't kill myself. You know, no matter how bad things might get, I won't kill myself because that's morality says. In the meantime, I'm loving my life and I have no reason to do it. And so the mere fact that they have an inclination doesn't rule out that they could get moral credit, but how would we know? How would we know that when push came to shove, they would really respect it? And Kant thinks we're very good at lying to ourselves about it. So it's in, it's in the cases where inclination conflicts with the moral law and someone continues to obey the moral law, that we have the clearest evidence that they act from what he calls from duty or from respect for the moral law. I'm doing it because it's what morality says to do, as against acting merely in accordance with the moral law. So I have a moral, I have, I have a moral obligation, you have a moral obligation not to cheat, to steal, to make false promises. Now, maybe I'm an honest businessman, and the reason I do it is because I want the reputation of being an honest businessman, because that is good for business. If I could make more money cheating the occasional person, I probably would, but as far as I can tell, that's bad for business. I am acting in accordance with duty, but not from duty. I don't really care about what morality tells me. It just so happens to line up with what is prudential right now. If, if, it, if I saw that it clearly, clearly being honest was bad for business, and I said, doesn't matter, I'm going to stay honest then you might think I am acting from duty, like because it matters to me. I have respect for the moral law. It is not some personal inclination. It is respect of moral law. Like I obey it. It, it, I, it has my respect, right? Did Kant ever um, describe a, a person like Peter Keating or maybe James Taggart for whom business is, uh, business is better when they're dishonest or whatever, when, when they're, when they're not being moral, they're not being honest, business is better, but yet it hurts them. I'm mean, take Keating as the clearest example. He gets miserable with age uh, because he has no uh, ego. He has no integrity. Uh, to, to Kant, is there such a, such a reward or punishment as that, or is he mostly just material when it comes to rewards? So that's interesting. So, um, the way Kant, as I said, the way Kant thinks of inclinations is just desires, and then happiness is satisfying so many desires. In his lectures on ethics, Kant looks, among others, at the Stoic theory. And the Stoics are really the first deontologists, that is the first kind of duty-based ethics system in the Western tradition. And so they have a lot in common with Kant. And Kant 
appreciates this, but the Stoics also have this view, but if you become the Stoics, the Stoic sage, the person who just cares about doing the moral law because it's what morality or nature wants you to do, um, that you become happy. And Kant thinks that's where the Stoics go wrong. Kant thinks you can, you can act from duty, you can become perfectly moral and not be happy. It all would depend on what your inclinations were. Kant thinks now maybe the person who is perfectly dutiful, they might have sort of a self-satisfaction. They might know that they deserve happiness because they are moral. He Kant does think that being moral to acting from duty makes you worthy of happiness, makes you deserve it. But he doesn't think that it in any way guarantees you will be happy. In fact, he's quite confident that there will be times where doing the moral law will make you unhappy. There are certain inclinations it will clash with. Kant thinks we have to have faith that we live in a world where you could be, everyone could be perfectly moral and still be reasonably happy. We may not live in such a world. We have to just have faith that it, that it's so. So Kant certainly thinks that self, like, that like the self-esteem that I might have because I am moral will not be happiness. And he thinks that morality will sometimes conflict with happiness, at, which as an amalgamation of desires. And he thinks that, um, and, and he thinks that there are different kinds of desires. He thinks some people will be more inclined towards money. He thinks others will be more inclined towards reputation. Some may even be inclined towards a kind of feeling they have about themselves of pride, um, which may or may not be dishonest. So in, in, the, in his works on anthropology, um, his anthropology and also the religion within the bounds of morality, uh, uh, within the bounds of reason alone, I mean, he talks about the ways that in like moral communities, people put on airs to try to seem um, holier than thou art. Get things that get at the second handedness of a Peter Keating or a Taggart. Um, and um, I mean, in general, he thinks it's all pretty shady and, and, and nasty, um, but it's not because he doesn't think it's, you know, shady and nasty because it's self-defeating because it doesn't really lead to true happiness. Um, he thinks of it because it's, it lies to the authority of reason when it sets down the moral law. Um, that's his problem with it. Yeah, okay. The Stoics were the first um, duty-driven moralists, uh, whereas all the other Greeks were value-driven. To them, it was about the pursuit of values. Um, now, the, the Stoics have what I like to call the vestigial organs of eudaimonism. So it's like, it's like they still like make lip service to things that, that, that talk about eudaimonia, which happiness or flourishing, and some of these other value pursuits. But the, the, heart, of the heart of it is the kathekon, doing the appropriate thing because it's what reason would have you do. Um, yeah. Okay, uh, and, and Kant is paying no lip service, or if anything, he might even be discouraging the consideration of eudaimonia, if I'm pronouncing that right. So Kant, it's interesting. So Kant thinks that we don't do the moral law. We don't, so the Stoics sort of say, like, at the end of the day, if you follow the moral law, because, or you follow your duties, because they're what nature bids you, you know, and you do it perfectly and everything, you'll be happy. Um, Kant does not give you that guarantee. And he, moreover, he says, that's not the reason to do it. You don't follow morality because it promises you happiness or anything else. You follow morality because it's morality. You do the right thing because it's the right thing. And that's what morality told you to do. And you respect it, right? If you have the right motivation, he thinks. Now, Kant does talk about the summum bonum, the highest good, but it doesn't play a teleological role in his ethics, the way the highest good does in a view like Rand's or in a view like Aristotle's or Plato's or the Epicureans or something where like you're, or even utilitarians where you're, where you're doing all these things in order to get at this good. The highest good for Kant is basically the best thing that there could be. And the best thing that there could be Kant thinks is a world where all the rational beings acted from duty out of respect for the moral law and on top of it, 
they were reasonably, whatever that means, sort of reasonably happy. They weren't totally miserable. That was, that's the best kind of universe that could exist. Everyone was moral, they acted from morality, and they were not hopelessly miserable as a result. Um, there would need to be a kind of common author of both the laws of morals and the laws of nature um, if those were ever to line up, something like God, which we could never know, but we could have faith that maybe that's the case. So at various points, come, we'll talk about, like, are we acting as if we're in pursuit of creating a world with that highest good, like act towards building a kingdom of ends to creating a world where everybody lives in this moral community and we're all moral agents and, and it's reasonably okay. Um, so it, it's not like he never brings it up. It's not like it has no role in his view or in like, our picture of what kind of world we're supposed to be creating for the sake of morality. Um, it's just that it's not the motivation. It's like, it's this thing we're maybe supposed to try to achieve, but we're not doing it so that we can live in happiness. Again, we're doing our duty just because it's our duty. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All rational beings ought to behave as though their action would be eligible it would be a good candidate for a universal action like something that every ra other rational being would do yes that's that's basically the first formulation of the categorical imperative so kant thinks that what morality turns out to be is a moral law that we act from not merely in accordance with then that's sort of like if you look at say the groundwork of the metaphysics of morals the kind of first section of it is establishing what the goodwill is and establishing the goodwill is this only thing that is unconditionally worthy. You have a goodwill when you act from duty, not merely in accordance with it, but you do the right thing because you do what morality tells you to do just because it's what morality told you to do. Um, and, but okay, but what does morality tell you to do? That's really the, the goal of the second section. And he says, well, what morality is, is a categorical imperative. It's an imperative. It's a thou shalt do this. It's a command. It has to be a command for beings like us because we have the capacity to not do it. So it has to be telling us to do it. It is categorical because it applies in all circumstances. It is not a if. It is not an if then. That's a hypothetical imperative. If you want to go to college, study in high school, right? Like, nope. It's do this. Not if anything. Like, don't lie. If I don't want, nope. Just don't lie. Right. Don't commit suicide. If I want it, nope, just don't do it. Um, now, how do I know what the categorical imperative is? Well, then we get these famous three formulations or three and a half or four formulations. Um, the formula of the universal law, which he also states is the law of nature, the formula of humanity, and the formula of the kingdom of ends. And the, formula, the most famous, the form formula of the universal law is... Um, Act always so that that maxim um, could be could be conceived of as as, as legislating universal law. I I'm not getting the the exact formulation right, unfortunately. If you look up one of my courses or, or look up anything on Kant, you can find it. Basically, the way that action works in Kant, I, we've talked about inclinations. Kant thinks we kind of walk around with essentially like these little rules or programming scripts. You could almost say. Um, so when I stop and pick up a penny, like you could think of it as I'm saying, I will pick up a penny if it's not too gross and I have time to do it and it's worth my effort and my back doesn't hurt or something like that. But it's really a kind of rule that I'm following and, and maxim and that we're always following these kinds of maxims. And Kant thinks, okay, well, the, 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 a categorical imperative is going to tell you sort of, it's actually going to be an imperative sort of on your maxims. What kinds of rules or policies should you be following? And the first way that Kant gets it, well, what should the content of morality be is by saying, well, morality has got to be a priori. It's got to be the kind of thing that's not just based on some experiences or others. It has to range over any possible experience and it has to be authoritative. It has to be a must. Okay. Well, what kind of thing could be like that? Well, Kant kind of flips it. And he says, well, wait a minute. Think of it like this. Morality, if morality is a always you must, 
then maybe morality is saying, don't do the kinds of things that couldn't be always, you must. So it says, if you form your maxims, don't, don't do it in such a way that it's the kind of thing that not everybody could do. In other words, if you say, I'm going to go around and kill people when I want, whenever I want to. It, and then it asks yourself, could everybody do that? No, like you couldn't will yourself to make that everybody's rule. It wouldn't, if we made it a law of nature, like everyone just had to do this, it would be chaos. So you have to do, act in the kind of way that your actions are universalizable types of actions. Or another way to put it is, you know, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. But that's a little oversimplistic, but it's more or less that this idea of act in a way that that's a sane way for everybody to act. That, that's a way you could will everyone to act. And it's a way that it would actually work if everyone did act that way. So it would not work if everybody lied when Kant thinks, if everybody lied whenever they felt like it, it, wouldn't, it would not be coherent. Why? Making promises would become meaningless because we would just break them all the time. There would be no point anymore. So it literally would be incoherent to, for everybody to just break a promise whenever they felt like it. So I can't make a maxim for myself of I'll break a promise whenever I felt, feel like it. Why not? If everybody did that, there'd be no such thing as promises at all. This is not a universalizable, sustainable kind of thing. Instead, I have to make my maxims the kind of thing that everybody could act on a policy like that. And everybody could act on a policy like I'll keep my promises, you know. The other, uh, uh, in a moment, I can talk about the formula of humanity. Mm -hmm. And the formula of humanity is so that I act as if um, I do not treat others merely as a means, but always also as an end in themselves. So um, I can't just treat you as a resource, as a thing to be used to get me what I want. I have to, at minimum, also think of you as something that exists for its own sake. In fact, as a moral being who exists to follow the moral law. That is what you are. That is what I am. I, you don't exist. So Kant thinks, I don't exist for my own enjoyment. You certainly don't exist just for my own enjoyment. I exist to carry out morality, you exist to carry out morality. Um, this is incidentally is why Kant is against masturbation. He thinks, you know, you're treating yourself just as a means of entertainment, which is not as this thing that's here to do the moral law. So it's undignified. Mm -hmm. Anyway. Okay. Um, so despite how much is wrong with what he's saying, we can sort of see some kind of merit in in or like this is the type of thing that made me wonder like if Kant even influenced Rand at, uh, through some uh, degree of separate of you know through a series of steps because like the fact that he's saying another person is not a means to your end but is a means to his own moral purpose is there's something positive happening there would you agree with that yeah I, I mean I think there's some there's certainly truth in the fact that other people are ends in themselves they're not your means to your ends um, and I think there's truth in, in the idea of of acting in a way that one way of thinking about moral action is but as a kind of as moral action is a kind of universalizable policy that is the virtues are, general principles that apply throughout human life. Um, that doesn't mean that what works for you will work for everybody or that you can only act in a way that would work for everybody, but it does mean, um, but, but it, I mean, morality isn't special for you. You don't have your own special rules that are different for other human beings. Um, that part is, is true. Um, and it's also the case, now, where Kant's sort of wrong about the formula of humanity is that we are to be an end in, in ourselves, I mean, I am here for my own sake. Kant thinks I'm not here for my own sake. He thinks I'm here for morality's sake, and so are you. Um, that part is radically different. Um, but the idea that you're not to be sort of sacrificed to my ends and nor I to yours is, is, is correct, I think. Um, and, um, and now, I take it that within the framework of 
a rational egoistic ethic. For an egoist, you have to show that treating other beings like yourself makes sense. So the first thing is, are these other beings like me? Yes, they are. That's basic kind of philosophical anthropology. That's just looking at other beings, seeing they're like you. Then the question is, okay, they're like me. Um, do I just, so what? What do I do about that? Do I still just do whatever I want or not? Um, and then, and then, um, and there, I think the kind of, it's a very important argument to show that letting other people function for their own sake, just as you is one is necessary for you to be a la left alone to be, to act for your sake. If you, if you can treat them, however you want, they can treat you however they want. That doesn't, that's not going to be good, but also that, um, but then also that that's the best way to get them for them to be their best for you to be your best and to get the most out of one another uh, in, in trade. So I, there's, a, there's a sort of argument there. Um, and sometimes I think, um, sometimes you might think altruists sort of think there shouldn't have to be an argument that I should have to treat other people like people. And I sort of grant you that like in terms of early development of empathy and things like that, like there's something a little bit wrong with you if very early on you don't seize on the fact that you can't just do anything you want to other human beings. But that said, I don't think that means that there shouldn't be and that there doesn't need to be a philosophical argument that it is in yours and anybody else's self-interest to treat other people as ends in themselves. Um, well, first off, that they are ends in themselves and that it's in your interest furthermore to respect that fact. Mm -hmm. I think in, in your uh, lecture way back then, you, you sort of explored a bit like, why would people buy this? Like, why would people buy into this? And I, if I understood you correctly back then, you were saying, like, look at what else uh, philosophers were saying. So you had like the utilitarians saying things like, uh, it's okay to kill one person to save two mm -hmm. lives. Whereas Kant is saying, oh no, like morality is not about if then. It's not what, what he calls hypothetical. It's saying... Um, you don't kill means you don't kill means you don't kill. So in, in that way, again, he Kant in his context might, might at times even look like the more, uh, the cl closer to what we are about, but still far from, far from yeah, what we're. I, I mean, uh, uh, Mill came later in the mid mm. uh, 19th century. He was influenced by Kant, but I mean, but in terms of like 20th and 21st century ethics, um, what draws some people to Kantianism against utilitarianism is the fact that Kantians have principles and utilitarians, tip, uh, like they try to jerry-rig sometimes principles, but they basically don't. Um, um, that, there, that there aren't these hard, fast lines, right? Um, or that there, that there isn't something sort of held sacrosanct about the individual person, right? So in a lot of utilitarian theories, if we're just maximizing happiness or maximizing pleasure and minimizing pain, we, you know, people are just bundles of subjective states and as are other conscious beings. And there's nothing particularly special about a, about a sack of feelings, right? Um, and if I can make more good feelings over there by squashing this sack of feelings over here, then like that, then I maximize it. Um, okay, like, and I've just, you know, I've squashed one sack but I've saved five sacks. And, but for Kant, those aren't sacks. Those are moral beings um, with, with a will um, that can choose to be moral and so on. Um, and um, for us, or for, for objectivism, it, it's, these, are ra these are human beings, ra and, you know, rational agents. Um, they have rights. For Kant, they have rights too. Um, and, um, and, and that's why, you know, you, you can't do it. And, and, and of course, utilitarians, consequentialists, many have tried to build rights back into their system, um, but it's very, very hard to make sense of it. Now, on the other hand, part of what they'll say is that, um, is that it's hard to make, from the consequentialist point of view or the utilitarian's point of view, it's hard to make sense of why there should be absolute sort of right if I can point out that there would be these instances where violating them would maximize something else more. And to some extent, you would have to resolve this by looking at what the end really is and whether what the 
whether the end properly conceived and human nature properly conceived is the kind of thing that could be furthered by violating these principles. And if you think of it as human life at, um, with humans understood as rational beings, rational and social beings who need individual rights, who need various liberties in order to function, then it can't, we can't actually get more of what we want. And anyway, there isn't a what we want, there's what each of us wants and then a system we create so that we can all have that if we choose. Mm -hmm. uh, should I jump to Super Chats or, yeah. or is there anything you wanted to, that, okay, I was gonna see if there's anything uh, you wanted to make sure is covered that we didn't get to. Um, okay, Robert with $2 says, this discussion will be phenomenal. I certainly, uh, I certainly hope it was. The Roland with 10 uh, euro says, would Kant consider traditional, quote, deadly sins like gluttony, lust, or pride to be necessarily immoral? Or could some of that be morally neutral in his framework? Let me think. Um, to the, um, most of them are, um, m most of them, so Kant primarily talks about four kinds of, four duties, uh, his kind of favorite examples. Um, so in the old German text, the, the Prussian textbooks he had to work with, there were duties to self, duties to others, and duties to God. He kind of throws out the duties to God, talks about duties to self and duties to others, and he talks about one perfect duty to self, one perfect duty to others, one imperfect duty to self, one imperfect duty to others. The, diff the difference of perfect and imperfect here is that perfect duties are things you can never do. And and imperfect duties are things you have to do at some point, but not always. So at some point you have to act to help other people, even though it doesn't benefit you. Um, not all the time, but you can't disregard benef benevolent, beneficent action altogether. Similarly, um, for self, you have to act to um, develop your capacities at some point. You can't just always be a lazy sack of crap. But like, but not, you don't always have to be doing it. You just can't say, I'm never going to do it. Okay, so some of these sins, to the extent that they are all encompassing, gluttony or sloth, would, I, I take it, undercut even that imperfect duty of developing your talents. Like, if all I ever did was what is fit, stuff my belly or just chill out or something, then I wasn't developing any of my talents or I wasn't doing anything to benefit other people. Um, Lust, I think, is going to be one where it's definitely going to run up against a bunch of his ethics. His, he has very stringent sort of sexual ethics. He, he thinks like sex really is only okay within the confines of marriage. Um, I think he thinks that like lust of I'm having sex and I'm just doing it because I just feel like doing it and I'm not treating you like another person and ex, et cetera, et cetera, that that and I'm not doing any kind of biological function in it, that would be bad. So bottom line is, I'm sure you could find lots of cases where lots of the traditional um, uh, sins run, would run afoul of Kant. All of it, I think he would understand in terms of his framework of duties and the moral law. And I also think Kant thinks that we're all guilty of the sin of pride. Um, and I think he also thinks we're all guilty of the sin of envy. His, his anthropology is just sort of, he takes a lot of inspiration from Rousseau. He thinks we're doing a lot of very hostile comparison between ourselves and others all the time. Um, and I, I think he just thinks human society is just rife with this. Um, and so I think he thinks we're gonna all be guilty of some of those sins. Okay, uh, Jonathan, thank you. Uh, thank you, Marilene, and then Marilene, uh, says we need more likes on the video that's right if you're on youtube everyone leave a like marilyn again thank you jonathan again thank you marilyn says we're here for morality's sake morality has values that's weird what does morality get out of my being here is that rhetorical so, yeah go ahead. um yeah i mean i i think the way the way kant sees it um i i, I guess morality doesn't get the moral law comes from pure reason or the new or the transcendent reason, numinal self, doesn't get anything per se out of, out of you following it. You don't get anything per se in terms of happiness out of following it, but there's a sense in which it is you and you're truly you and yourself if you follow it. At least that's Kant 
mid 1780s. And, um, and I think he thinks that it just has this uneliminable normativity. Like it's just this, it, reason has authority to tell us what to do. It tells you what to do, so do it. Um, it's, it is, uh, you know, cause I said, in a sense it's cause I said so writ large. Now the I turns out to be yourself, not the empirical you, some higher out of this world you, but it's supposed to be you. So whether you buy that or not, um, you may or may not take it more seriously, but that's at least supposed to be the kind of structure. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, um, and, and at the end of the day, again, like it, this is very, it's purely deontological. We're not doing morality for anything, for the sake of any other thing. We're doing morality just because it's morality. Um, it's, so it is deontological. I am bound to do it. I must do it. Not axiological, not because I value something that I'm going to get. Well, Enric with 999 says, does Kant see the universality of ethics derived from reason? If so, doesn't Kant see the value of individuals discovering them through reason rather than blindly following them? That's a good question. Um, Kant is there has very little that's, I think, informative to say about how we discover the kind of content or morality. Once he tells you how he derives but his, his notion of a categorical imperative. And then you, once you have the categorical imperatives, various formulations, you can sort of deduce duties from it. However, Kant thinks that is not how we found out that we have a duty not to commit suicide or that we have a duty to keep our promises. Kant thinks we all just know that. So there is this very much, it's, you could say it's very parochial to a certain kind of point in Christian Europe or something, but. Kant just thinks, we all know we're not supposed to lie. We all know we're not supposed to commit suicide. We all know we're supposed to help other people once in a while. Um, we know it. Like All of it is debatable about is if we want to do it or not. And most of us don't want to do it. And sometimes when we don't want to do it, we pretend we don't know it. But we know it. And that's Kant's, Kant says that often, um, that you know what your duty is. You just don't want to acknowledge it. And so that... Um, so the kind of view of like, well, wouldn't reason have to discover what, what it is? Kant thinks no. Um, and, and now let me add one more point, which is that if it did do that, it would be a posteriori. It would be well over many centuries of history and human interaction, we've learned it works better, better, right? To do this rule rather than that rule. And none of that would be, have what he calls apodictic certainty. None of it would have sort of deductive rigor. None of it would be necessary. None of it would be binding. It would just seem like, it seems like it works, but maybe it won't tomorrow, or maybe it won't work for some other reason. Um, anything that had the form of, this seems to work for that, can't be morality. Anything that of the form of, in the past, this has worked that can't be what morality is. So it kind of makes sense that morality couldn't just be something that reason discovered over time from experience, because that would be a posteriori and it wouldn't, it wouldn't have either the epistemic necessity, nor would it have the moral um, normativity, the thou shalt kind of imperative strength that he thinks it has to have to be morality. Okay, no, no time for more super chat questions, but feel free to send more super chats to show your appreciation and support the network. So, is Kant's um, and we, we got a couple minutes. Um, is Kant's kingdom of ends like this? Uh, this sort of um, number of rational beings acting morally. Does he is he conceptualizing this kingdom kind of like you would look at a bunch of animals acting independently and call that the animal kingdom? Would you, is he, is he being, is he conceptualizing something that's a, a series of spontaneous actions or he, is he saying the kingdom of ends is something that should be like deliberately planned and engineered and, and then gives like dictators, like kind of a blueprint for how to engineer society? Well, it's um, the realm of ends would, I mean, it's something that individuals are all acting towards. So in that sense, it's from the bottom up, um, kind of organically grown, so to speak. Um, 
uh, crowdsourced. Um, but it is a, I think the idea is if all of us are following the moral law, including kind of this beneficent action, we could over time create a society where we brought our mutual, our various ends sort of into harmony with one another. Um, at least that's the dream. Um, again, I don't think Kant thinks, I think Kant thinks maybe in theory it should be possible. I don't think Kant thinks like it'll, it's ever going to happen, but we have to act towards it. Think of it like this, like think of it as if I was telling everybody like, try to every day act so that one day we reach Star Trek world, right? Like when it comes to racism, like work towards Star Trek world, where like we think of skin color the way we think of hairstyle, like it doesn't mean anything to us, right? Like, will we ever get there? I don't know, you know, but everybody should act towards it like that one day. I think he thinks like that, that way of acting towards it, it would be something like that. I don't think the, the kingdom of ends, I don't think he thinks could be the kind of thing created top down um, because everybody's ends have to sort of be brought into harmony. And those ends can't be sort of brought into harmony just by, by force. Um, we would have to kind of work to coordinate that. Okay, at the end of last our last discussion, you suggested we, we do an episode about ethics. Uh, do you think it would be worthy worthwhile to do an episode about Kant's politics and how his overall philosophy ended up uh, uh, shaping political developments in the world? What do you think um, of that? So, you uh, it I, I, in theory, I think it's worthwhile. I am, I, I would need to do some more studying. Um, I, I never, Kant's political theory is never something I really specialized in. I honed in more on his metaphysics, his epistemology and his ethics and, and his theory of religion. Um, I'm, I feel a little weak on his politics and then certainly worthwhile, but again, not my specialty is his aesthetics. Um, what I can say is that so in Kant's lifetime, his political theory, I mean, he was a member, of, he was a main figure of the Enlightenment. Most of his po political thought was known um, from a, a small work, uh, uh, both from something called What is Enlightenment and then Towards Universal Peace, where Kant talks about like the dream of one day having a world full of constitutional republics, basically. That, and because like other Enlightenment thinkers, he thinks it's all, we, it's only when we have a bunch of republics with you know, laws and individual rights sort of that we're, that we're gonna stop war. Um, and that was, that was in his own lifetime how his political thought was known. He all, for much of his uh, developed career, he wanted to write a metaphysics of morals. So we, um, the groundwork of metaphysics of morals is the mid 1780s, but the metaphysics of morals doesn't come out to the end of the 1790s, very late in his life. And it has a part on the doctrine of right where you get more of his kind of core political theory. But people, not a ton of people had read that. And, and, and in fact, um, in many ways, like by the, 17, the late 1790s, Kantians had moved on from Kant. So like Kantians were reading students of Kant and mm -hmm. like other people from Kant. That was like the new hotness like the yeah. old Kant was like, yeah, 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 you're great, Kant. Like, but like nobody's reading your like your late book. So, but over time, subsequently, his stuff on rights <clears throat> in the metaphysics of morals have had more influence. And in the 20th century, more people have revisited it. So we could look at it and we could discuss some of that stuff together. Um, the stuff on, oh, okay. His stuff on teleology and aesthetics from the third critique, the critique of the power of judgment that had a lot of influence and, um, and on how people thought about art and aesthetics. And that would be worth talking about too. Okay. Well, that sounds great. And uh, we will, we'll be talking and we'll be talking coming up at 7 PM UK time, which is in a few minutes, hard money with Jim, hard money, Jim with Jim Brown. The subject is inflation. It's everywhere. Then at 8 PM UK time, it's James Valiant, Robert and Amy Nasir discussing an exercise in philosophical detection an essay by Leonard Peikoff from the second volume of the Objectivist Forum, October 1981. All right. Uh, thanks, Jason. This was wonderful. Um, now, Kant, by the way, supported the American Revolution. So lest anybody think Objectivist should, should uh, be real cool with anyone who seems to be a political ally, I will just put that out there. 
Um, there are some things more important than uh, political positions and opinions and policy. But now here I am um, throwing, opening that can of worms when we're out of time. Talk soon, Jason. Yeah. But by the way, there's been some, uh, it's actually very hard to pin down where or how he might have supported that bit about the American Revolution. It, it's, um, it's not that well supported but um oh. he did not like the british and i think he kind of wanted them to get punched in the nose so well anyway. you hear that uh arc uk british people kant hates you so you'd better choose rand anyway enough with my little quips let's get the heck out of here we're out of time see you soon thanks everybody and Thank goodbye you.